morning. You are cordially invited to our second session with six presentations. And here is where the problem begins. Six speakers in 90 minutes, so forgive me, I have to be ruthless. Otherwise, we will compromise the later speeches in this session. So my suggestion and my request to all of these presenters today, all the laureates who are going to give a presentation is, please, if possible, stick to 15 minutes. Otherwise, we are inevitably running in a time problem. So, as our first speaker, I would like to ask Sonam Wangchuk from the Himalayan Institute of Alternatives to take the floor and give his speech. Sonam. Um, please, everybody might speak in the micro, otherwise we cannot record it. So the micros are connected to the recorder, and if you don't speak in the micro, there won't be anything recorded. So please, take the micros. Sonam. Okay. Hello. <clears throat> Good morning, and Julie, as we greet in Ladakh. So I'll uh, share with you a little journey of mine about engaging young people through education by bringing reforms in not just performing a ritual that is called education with just paper knowledge, paper degrees, paper exams, but actually engaging them to solve uh, real-life problems in the world, especially environmental problems. Uh, since it is about a place called Ladakh in the high Himalayas, very different from anything we see, I'll need some pictures to speak more than my thousand words. So it's uh, top of India and um, next to Tibet uh, in the Himalayas. A very different topography as you can see. It looks like a lunar scape rather than <laughs> landscape. Um, you would think life was not possible until you carefully look at the oasis that there are in this high altitude desert. Uh, people have not only survived in these harsh conditions, but a whole civilization has thrived over the millennia with its own culture, lifestyle, music, dances, and so on. Yes, we are a very tiny microscopic minority in the vast uh, tropical uh, country of India, and therefore we face a lot of problems, especially, especially in education, but in everything. Things that work in New Delhi or New, New York do not work in Ladakh, uh, as you can see in this picture that epitomizes. Just a simple thing as running tap water becomes an ordeal when you just transplant it to these mountains from New Delhi. <clears throat> so there, therefore we are a climatic and technological minority as well. But hardest hit are the children in the mountains in education because things when they are just blanket applied in a mountain, you know, it doesn't make any sense what uh, often makes no sense in New Delhi or New York also. So when you take it to the mountains, it makes even less sense. I came face to face with this uh, so, uh, somewhat wasteful and meaningless education system that our children have to go through 16 to 18 years when I was finishing my own engineering and had to earn to support my own education. So I taught 10th uh, grade students in schools and that changed my life to see how shocking the results were. 95% of the students were failing every year in the 10th grade exams after 10 years you know, the passport to higher education or employment. And I thought it is more important to bring reforms in this system than to add another engineer to the crowd. So I have been ever since mostly working in education, but also using engineering to solve environmental problems of the region. So we started with a big campaign to bring reforms in government schools in the mountains to make them relevant. But first, by approaching people, people in the villages change their priorities towards education and learn to demand from the state quality, relevant education. And to do this, we used the victims of the education. We were ourselves, the students, going village to village to change the people. And in a democracy, if you change the people's priorities, then leaders follow. So on one hand, we helped people demand. And on the other hand, we helped 
the state deliver also, otherwise it will only be conflict. So we helped the state develop textbooks that were relevant to the mountains, trained the teachers and reoriented them so they can teach in a way that makes sense to the place, the context. And very soon the results went up from 5% success to slowly 75% success nowadays. But, but that is uh, not the end because any failure is not acceptable. Nobody fails. It's only the system fails them. So we said those who still fail, we should take even more care of them. And for them, we started a very special school. If they don't learn the way we teach them, then teach them the way they learn. So we started a special school in the middle of the desert, away from any place. Uh, nearest village is half an hour away um, on the bank of Indus. And uh, it was a total desert where we started this school um, where students learn by being there and doing things, not from textbooks, not from teachers alone, but by running the whole system and solving all the problems. So they run the school as a little country. This school uh, is run like a little country with a little government that, and a little parliament that changes every two months, but is very real. The elected leader gives uh, other students serious responsibilities. That is how the school is run, actually. And they plan, they execute, they report, and learn accountability and other skills that way. And the running of the school is practically by the students. They take care of all the cows that give us milk and make us independent that way. And all the energy that is produced here, all the food, ve organic vegetables, power plants, and so on. So the school actually is self-reliant in many ways, financially also, because it's the students who do most of the things. And doing, by the way, is the best way of learning. So we don't have to write grants for food, for energy, which is the highest in a cold place like Ladakh. It's all produced. And therefore, we could very soon become autonomous in financial terms also. Students apply what they learn, abstract theories, into practical things. For example, germ theory makes no sense. It becomes a hard thing to remember out of context. But in context, it is hard to forget. So the students use it for fruit preservation, for example. Every year, we have a jam-making festival where all the students go and use this jam theory to make hundreds of bottles of jam, half of which they consume over the year. The other half, they sell in the market. And for that, they have to plan and you know, market it and learn economics that way. With the profit, they go on a tour to the tropical plains of India, going down the Himalayas, learning geography on the way, coming back they report about their experience in this little country's little newspaper and little radio and gain real life experience are ready for facing life because they are living a real life here at the school itself. Innovations are a part of the school um, and they revolve around the context of earth, sun, ice and fire. Well, starting with Earth, Earth is the material right under our feet and perfect for building our houses. It's only because there's no money in Earth that no companies promote it. Otherwise, it's perhaps the best material. So we, all the campus, the whole campus is built of nothing but Earth as the material and heated by sun as the energy. This whole campus is very different. Not only that, it, uh, the cr admission criteria here is that you have failed in your exams and not bright percentages and so on. But it is also an experiment in our lives, whether we can live comfortable lives without destroying the Earth. So this is a completely off-grid campus since 1996. 94, it was established, and it has been powered by solar panels for electricity, but architecturally designed to not need any heating, even in Ladakhi winters. How uh, it started in 94 was with a desert like this, um, with nothing, as I said. The earth that forms the slopes became the buildings. And the sun that hits the place anyway became our energy source. We started with a permaculture workshop where we planned what we will do uh, on this, you know, uh, planning it to face south where the sun stays in winter and to 
plant trees so that it breaks the wind which makes it very cold so that other plantations would be supported and we exactly did like that. So before we came here, two years before we planted those trees uh, at the very corner, th th those as wind breaks so that it will pr protect the rest and this is where the sun stays so we oriented all buildings towards the south and built with heavy mass, good insulation and that's how the buildings stay very warm and with built with yeah dirt cheap materials there's no garbage left no import no export and uh, very simple cheap technologies that we developed indigenously you know there can be expensive solar buildings but this just has a plastic sheet that comes down in winter and makes a greenhouse and it goes up in summer and makes it look like a normal building so uh, warm is beautiful in winter and uh, summer you can have enjoy aesthetic beauty very simple use of the high school science really to make life simple you have heat chapter in science in 10th grade 9th grade that's what he's using convection conduction radiation as forms of heat transfer so heat uh, builds up in the greenhouse with the sun the air heats up and students keep the windows open during the day hot air goes in it delivers its heat to the walls becomes cool and dense comes back into the greenhouse all day there is a convection current going on without any power any moving parts no fuel nothing and at night they close the windows and the rooms stay at plus 15 roughly uh, even in minus 15 winters for 22 years we have not dropped uh, burnt a drop of oil or blade of wood uh, for heating at this place all the buildings are designed so that they are naturally lit no need for artificial lighting. Any artificial lighting uh, or power is, you know, used with uh, photovoltaics or cooking is done with concave mirrors, dishes, and uh, water heating that students develop their own, which is a fraction, hundredth of a cost of uh, <coughs> vacuum and other things, but works. <clears throat> Everything from pumping water from the Indus or uh, vegetables in winter and nowadays slowly towards transport, all solar on at this campus, so much so that even the cows live in solar heated cow sheds. And as a reward, we didn't mean to, but as a reward, they give nearly three times more milk in winter than any cows in Ladakh. <laughs> you can guess why? Our theory is that they are warm-blooded animals. They have to keep their bodies at 37 degrees. If not solar warm rooms, then their food will go into creating that heat. But if you give it by sun, then the milk production goes up. Now, the students are engaged in such solutions, like the warm buildings. They go out, and now we have been working on water issues, creating ice stupa artificial glaciers, taking on from some other senior engineers who were working on it. Three years ago, we, my students, we worked on ice stupa artificial glaciers, which is very simple. Uh, it's just, again, very simple science without the use of any, uh, what do you call, moving parts, you can make an ice mountain. Put a pipe upstream and bring it downstream where you need the water, there is gravitational uh, energy and pressure built up in the pipe. You put a fountain and then it sprays water in the air, minus 20 air. Water falls down in drops and freezes, freezes, freezes to become a cone. And a cone, by the way, is a geometric shape that has, the, that has minimal surface area for the volume. Therefore, sun cannot melt it because sun requires surface. We require volume and both are happy. Sanam, so I'm, I'm sorry, time's over. Could you okay. give it a cut? Can I just show the last and, yeah? Is this special? Yeah. No? I'm stopping, but stopping takes time. <laughs> okay, so these are the cones of ice. It's uh, like 25 meters now, and it holds about um, 1 million liters. And as a proof of concept, we have planted 5,000 trees. Uh, watered by this in the early spring months before glaciers melt and uh, this got the Rolex award for 2016. With the money of Rolex we are starting a new university, an alternative university for mountains which will engage young people in finding solutions to mountain people's problems on this desert to make it like this using these artificial glaciers. This is the desert in reality 
and this is how we hope to make it uh, a, a university and then a city all green built with mud and powered by the sun where everything is active school of business will start run actual real businesses that are sustainable tourism will run hotels and that income will support this university not people's fees money so it will be free education for all and that's not the end yet <laughs> Thank you very much, Sonam, for this excellent presentation and just in time. I would like to suggest, if you have any questions, please keep it, as I think for the course now of this session, it's much better that we put a number of questions together after a couple of presentations and not go for each of one that would cost us too much time. <laughs>